Good morning and welcome back to this series of tutorials on plant simulation. In the previous video, we solved an exercise using the assembly station, the dismantle station, and the pick and place. Today, we will extend this exercise to solve more complex flows. Specifically, with respect to the exercise in the previous video, we are going to change the parts of the flow that are highlighted in orange. To begin, in the container entry area, we are going to establish a control so that reused containers have priority over new ones. On the other hand, we are going to modify the transport of the containers to road transport so that we can move containers two by two from the palletizing area to the depalletizing area. I have created a copy of the exercise in the previous video so as not to lose progress. The only modification I have made is to update the paths of the parts that are in the production table since this table is not automatically updated, as is the case with the container class path in the container source. Let's begin the modifications of the model by reusing the containers. So far we have seen that material flow objects have a tab that allows us to control the different exit strategies, the exit tab. But in this case we need to control the input strategy of the assembly station, not the output. For cases like this there is the flow control object. Let's instantiate the new class and connect it to the rest. The flow control object is specifically designed to generate input and output part flow strategies. In fact, as you see, it is only prepared to define these strategies. In the output part, it offers some strategies different from those that come by default in the rest of the material flow objects, but what interests us for this exercise are the input strategies. By default, a FIFO strategy is defined, so the first pieces to request access will be the ones that pass. In our case, to give priority to some containers over others, we are going to select the strategy Start at Predecessor 1. With this strategy, as long as there is a container in Predecessor 1, it will pass with priority. Otherwise, it will look at Predecessor 2 and so on. For this strategy to be effective, we must ensure that Predecessor 1 is the conveyor of the used containers. If it wasn't, the quickest way to change it would be to delete the Predecessor 1 and recreate it. In this way, the Predecessor 1 will become the one that was previously 2, and the one that was previously 1 now becomes the number 2. Next, we will model the road transport between the palletizing and depalletizing stations. To do this, the first thing we need is to insert the roads. Plant simulation offers us two different objects to model them, the tracks and the two-lane tracks. Both are found in the Material Flow Objects tab and are used in a very similar way to conveyors, except that one is a single road and the other is a two-way road. For this exercise, we are going to use the two-lane track object, since it is more complete. As we see, it allows us to define the length and width of the track. But unlike the conveyor, we cannot define the speed, since the tracks can only circulate MUs of the transporter type, which are self-propelled, and therefore each one can have a different individual speed. However, for both the conveyor and the track, or the two-lane track, when dragging from the class library, it does not allow us to draw it freely and make curves or several sections, as when we draw it from the toolbox. To remedy this, we are going to create a toolbox tab specific to our exercise. We simply right-click on the exercise folder and select New Toolbar. We are going to rename it with the same name, Exercise 4. Now we have a new Toolbox tab where we can create access to the classes of our own library. To use them, we simply drag each of our parents to the new tab. Once we have them all, we can drag them from here directly to the frame to start using them. In turn, for conveyors and tracks, we can simply click on them and start drawing without the restrictions we had before and without having to use the ones that come by default. Now that we have our road drawn, we are going to need a vehicle to travel on it. To do this, we will do as with the rest of Amuse, instantiate a source and pass it the Transporter Object class. Obviously, we will first need to generate our own MU Transporter class, which is like the others in the Mobile Units folder. 
Now we instantiate a source, connect it to our two-lane track and tell it to generate a transporter vehicle. Let's also define that the source only generates a single transporter. If we now play it, we will see how a transporter actually appears, travels along lane B and stops when it reaches the end. We needed to be able to constantly go back and forth from the assembly station to the dismantle station, so we are going to connect the two lanes so that the transport will be able to turn around. To do this, we simply connect each end of the track with itself, as I'm showing on the screen. In this way, if we start the model again, we will see how it is now able to turn around when reaching each end. However, it would be necessary to indicate in some way to the assembly that it should load the pallet in the transport, and to the dismantling that it should unload it. The first thing we're going to do is define the transport capacity so that it only carries containers two by two. So, we open the class that we just created, go to the Load Bay tab, and modify the three dimensions so that the product of the three gives us two. In my case, I'm going to define dimension x as one, so one times one times two gives me two. I am also going to disable the vector graphics option in the graphics tab so that it is better visually. Finally, to load and unload the containers, we are going to use the transfer station object. This object is not loaded by default in the class library, so the first thing we will do is import it. We go to the General Toolbar, Home tab, and click on Manage Class Library. As we have already explained in the first video of this series, here we can manage the objects that appear in the class library by default and import only those that we will need to use so that the model is lighter. The basic objects are almost all imported by default, but if we go to the second tab, we will see that most of the advanced objects are not selected. We are going to click on the transfer station object to activate it, and we are going to click OK. Now the transfer station appears both in the Tools tab and in the Tools folder of the class library. These objects provide more advanced options than basic objects, but are also more protected. That is why if we try to create a copy directly of the transfer station object in our folder, Plant Simulation will not allow it. However, there is a way to get around this limitation. Instead of creating a copy of the object directly, we are going to copy the entire library. By doing so, we will see that other folders with more objects have also been generated. The object that interests us is just below in the first level, without entering the rest of the folders. And to have it more accessible, we are also going to drag it to our toolbar. And we are going to instantiate it in the frame. As we see, the Transfer Station menu is also somewhat different from the rest, since it has an extra layer of customization. This object is designed to move MUs between different types of elements in an advanced way. For the case that affects us, we want to move containers from the assembly station to the vehicle that we have stopped on the two-lane track. So, in the Attributes tab, the first thing we will do is make sure that it is defined as Load. Then, in the Parts from Box, we will click on the ellipsis and select the assembly station. In the Target is On, we will do the same and select the two-lane track. We will see that it now asks us to indicate the position of the sensor and in which lane we want to put it. Sensors are represented by a small red stripe on the track and allow commands to be executed every time a MU passes by it. In general, it is necessary to program the code that the sensor has to execute, but the transfer station does that job for us. We will see more examples of using sensors in my other course on programming in SimTalk. We are going to define that the load sensor is in lane B and in a position of 6 meters. If we now press Apply, we will see that it has actually been drawn here with a red line. In the Times tab, we can define if we want the upload and download to have a recovery process time, but we are going to leave it as default. Finally, on the Advanced Attributes tab, let's make sure that the Always Stop Target Container option is active. That will cause the transporter to stop at the sensor until the charge is complete. In the same way, we will need a second transfer station to unload the vehicle. The process is very similar, but in this case the type of station will be download. The origin will be the end of line A of the two-lane track, and the target will be the dismantle station.
In this case, it will not be necessary to activate the Always Stop Target Container option since it will appear disabled. Now, if we run the model again and move forward a little in time, we will see how the flow behaves exactly as we want. The vehicle stops at the first sensor and waits for two containers to be loaded before continuing. Enter the opposite lane, reach the second sensor, and also wait to unload the two containers before repeating the cycle. Furthermore, we see how the last container never enters the circuit due to the entry priority that we have defined for the assembly station. In the next video, we will give this flow a new twist and add operators or workers. Greetings, and until the next video!